Good morning, if you'll please be seated. Good morning. <laughs> um, good morning and welcome. We are so happy to have you all here. Today is Sunday, December 11th. My name is Cheyenne Cage. For those who don't know me, I don't think there's very many of you, but <laughs> I will be your liturgist for the special month of December. Um, we trust that everybody had a wonderful week this week. To our listeners who may be listening virtually, thank you guys for tuning in. Those present, please sign and pass the attendance pad as we would appreciate a record of all who are here today. As we enter this third Sunday of Advent, we are reminded of joy. This Sunday is also known as Gaudet Sunday. I think I said that right. If I butchered it, somebody let me know. But this is a Latin term that means to rejoice. This is a time for coming together as a church family and recognizing all of the areas in our lives that we have experienced the Lord's joy. Let us use this opportunity this morning to dive into scripture, to reflect, and to rejoice. God is so, so good. And a couple of announcements. If you are wanting to purchase a poinsettia, um, same as last week, they will be $20, and you can talk to the church office about that. Um, tonight is our Christmas cantata. It will be at 6 o'clock at the Earth United Methodist Church. Um, and it consists of five churches coming together to create beautiful music and worship our Father this evening. So definitely check that out. Oh, and there's a meal afterwards. I told y'all if I don't write it down, I forget it. <laughs> um, are there any other announcements this morning? Oh, the flowers on the altar are from Walter's funeral this past week. All right, and if there are no other announcements, I will turn it over to Bob. Well, I believe it is time for to celebrate with the Advent candle lighting. Readings today are from Isaiah and Psalms. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much a joy. The psalmist says, happy are these whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith, who executes justice, gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. Yeah. 
Hitler. Would you please stand and join with us as we sing Joy to the World, and it can be found on page 246 in the hymnal. If you, if you would this morning, um, bow your heads with me as we, as we pray. Father, it is so good to, to be able to have the privilege just to lift our voices to you. As we reflect in this time of year, we... Are reminded of the wonder, the joy, the utter amazement of your son being born, born of that, born of a virgin. And all God, all man, to walk among us, to teach us, and eventually to die for us. We gather here this morning because we believe in our hearts that he did all these things. That he fulfilled all those prophecies that were spoken about him. And he is indeed the Messiah, the hoped for one. And so as we worship this morning... It's with a full heart. And even as we, as was spoken of earlier, with joy in our hearts. We're not those who are desperate. We're not those who feel lost. But we're those who are filled with hope. We're filled with life because of Jesus. Because of our Christ. And so we thank you, Father. We thank you that we have this great joy within us that you've provided. We thank you, Lord, that in Christ we see the most wonderful grace and amazing mercy that you've extended to us. And we begin to have a grasping of the amazing love that you have showered upon us. 
And it fills us with such a joy and an overwhelming feeling of goodness, Lord, that we can hardly put into words. And it causes us to, to just rejoice and to, to want to sing, to want to praise, and want to just adore you once more. And we pray, Father, that it wouldn't be something that we're just doing this morning. But that as we praise you and adore you and worship you this morning, we would desire, Lord, for that to be a way of life for us. That no matter where we are and what we do, we would exalt the name of Jesus. And we would love him and worship him all of our days. For he indeed is our Savior, our King, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is our everything, our everything. And so again, Lord, we say thank you this morning. We reflect, Lord, that sometimes, not sometimes, but some people are hurting even this morning, struggling. We struggle with sickness. We struggle with injuries and many things. But even in the midst of our injuries, our illness, our, our hurts, there's a refreshment that comes into us. There's a renewal that comes into us, Lord. There's hope that fills us. Because we know you're, we belong to you. Because we're your children. And we've been made so by the precious blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would be with each one who's hurting, all those who are sick, Lord. And we pray, Father, that you would move all of us, that we wouldn't just worship in this place, Lord, that, but that when we go out from this place, we would want to tell another of the great joy that is in Jesus Christ. We would want to share the, the incredible blessing that fills our hearts and minds with the people around us. We would want all people to know the truth and the glory of God that's in Jesus Christ. So Father, we don't ask just that you would equip us because you already have. But we pray, Lord, that you would move us and motivate us even more. And then when we see that opportunity or when we're moved to speak, Lord, that you would use us to speak in a way that only you can. And you would be changing hearts once more having miracles in the hearts of a, a newborn each day. Born again to life and hope and salvation. Father, we thank you for all of this. We pray, Father, that you would just bless this time, Lord. We pray, Father, that we, as we sing and as we worship and exalt you, that it pleases you. We pray now, Father, that as we have bring our offerings and our tithes to you this morning as we bring our, our gifts, Lord. We thank you that you will use it to grow your kingdom, that you will use it in the way that only you can, and that you would guide us in every manner and how you would desire that to be used. And we thank you once again, Father. We thank you. We give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And yes, indeed, it is in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Here she comes. Oh, you're all Christmassy today. I love it. Come sit down by me. You got sick people at your house? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, we have lots of sick kids today, but they're going to be well and perform for you next week at, in church. So you need to be here, right? And sing, yeah, and sing your song. We're singing fun songs today. They're Christmas carols. Yeah, because Christmas is coming, right? And Christmas means that Jesus came to the world. <gasps> he didn't leave us to fend for ourselves. He came to save us, right? So we can sing joy to the world, which we sang already today, right? And then we're going to sing there's a song in the air. Why is there a song in the air? Who sang? Do you know who sang in, in, at the night to the shepherds? Yeah, who sang? Do you remember? And then the angels sang and came because the Savior was here. And then the shepherds followed. Remember, we're going to sing about the shepherds following next year. And then we're going to sing at the end this song called Heart the Herald. Angels sing. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah, that's real weird. Well, heart means listen. We need to listen to what the angel said. Because the angel said that unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior. And he's your Savior and mine. So we can be happy. So I have a thing for you to put in your room. Isn't that a pretty little dear? It says joy to the world. Remember joy because Jesus came and he's our savior okay let's pray can you pray with me dear Jesus thank you so much for coming to earth and being my savior amen there you go good job would you like a Oh, that's my favorite. Okay. Oh. Okay, it's time for our blessings and celebrations. And I wasn't here Thursday, so I wasn't able to make it to Walter's funeral, but I just wanted to lift Walter up in his, his memory and uh, say that he was a joy and a blessing to know and that he will be missed. And uh, we were out of town last weekend, um, but Bradley celebrated a birthday um, out in, I don't know where his ship is, but he has still not made it home and so they're still out keeping us safe. So keep him in your prayers. And God is good all the time. And all the time. Would you stand and please join us as we sing in our hymnals? Let's, yep. Uh, <laughs> ex, uh, section 249 and then 219. Get ready to sing that one next.
Good morning, y'all. If you would, uh, bow your heads and pray with me once more. Father, we thank you for the privilege to sing, to worship and exalt you. And, and we thank you for your word that we open now. We pray, Father, that as we open it, as we hear it as we re open our hearts to receive these words from you. Father, we, we just thank you and, and we ask, Lord, that you would work in our hearts and minds in such a way, Lord, that you would even now be transforming us all the more. Lord, we, we desire and we need to hear from you. We don't really need to hear from another man or woman. But in the depths of our soul, we need your word every day. So please, Father, speak now to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Christ's birth is, uh, well, it's told over and over again, isn't it? How often do you get tired of hearing it? I hope never. If you think about it, and, and I, I just want to kind of play a contrast to you in a little bit. You think about how um, we bring children into this world today. And we have, um, we're so privileged with, with so much good medical care and all the, I mean, our babies, our children are brought into this world uh, um, better cared for maybe than they ever will be. And, and such a delight that we have to bring these blessed children, these gifts from God in to our families. And it's all done in a, in a typically a very beautiful, a very clean, a very caring environment where even the father is able to be part of the um, action, even though he, typically he doesn't really have a clue what's going on. But yet there's this, this sense of, of, of what we've come to, Lord, is, of, is very beautiful and very um, clean, pretty, and joyous. Amen? I mean, it's just, and it's just a joy. Well, the last the church I was at in Iowa before I, we moved to Texas... I was counting the other day, trying to remember how many children were born over so many years, and I counted up to about 15. And each one was unique and wonderful, but you know, it's just a treasure that you watch as you watch the, the church family grow. Um, but today we're gonna to talk about a, a, a really different birth, uh, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as it's 
spoken of in, in Luke chapter 2. Um, long ago, the one whom the whole world celebrates even, Jesus, born to the Virgin Mary, came into our lives. It's fascinating to think that the Son of God would come into this world without all the things that we depend on today. He didn't have any of it. None of it. And so as, you, as we think this through it and as we read it and kind of work through it this morning, um, this chapter, Luke 2, 1 through 21, it reveals the hearts of men and the host of heaven praising and glorifying God for the humble and meek arrival of the child we know as the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. He's our King, our Lord, our Savior. He's our everything. But yet when we read this in Luke, may I, I, I pray in this morning, even as you think about it again, that it just grip your hearts because it is just such a powerful story. And I want to challenge you this morning as you, as you listen to it to slip out of culture. I want you to slip away from all the things that you're comfortable with and leave the domesticated view of Jesus' birth behind and grab on to the astonishingly glorious yet beautiful, brutally direct birth of our King. And when I say that, I want you to consider for a moment just how um, we picture things in our day. I, I mean, we, we know what the scriptures say but all around us, even a, even a, a manger scene at, at homes, I delight in such things. But do they really reflect the truth? Or are they just kind of fancy and pretty and have some of the things that we know are true in there and maybe a lot of other things added in and, and they look beautiful and we adore them, but maybe, maybe just not quite reality. And so I challenge you to listen to reality this morning. Listen to how Luke writes this amazing story of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, I, I, I would encourage you to read along with me. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. This is Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with, his, with Mary, his betrothed who was with child, and maybe I can learn to read here. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone all around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there were with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, 
When he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Luke 2, 1 through 21. The text is careful to point out that the reason why Joseph was in Bethlehem was the, the decree of a pagan emperor, Caesar Augustus. Okay, so you want to kind of hold that thought for a second and then realize that the prophecy that was spoken hundreds of years prior saying that this child would be born in Bethlehem God made sure that Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem via a pagan king. Now think about that for a minute. That's what got them there. They went there because of this census, of this being, being required to register themselves by a pagan king. But the pagan king had no idea that he was serving the purposes of Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty. He didn't realize that, but yet he was. And if you think about that just for a minute, as we're just kind of walking into this story this morning, here's a picture of the sovereign God of the universe, okay, manipulating and working and doing everything that he wants to do to make things happen exactly as he said they would happen. And if, if you think about that for just a minute, does it give you a treasure in your heart when you start thinking of the prophecies that are yet to come? And knowing that what he said, he's going to make sure it happens. We don't have to wonder about that. We, he, we can see right here, it doesn't matter what he needs to do, he will make it happen. And in fact, he will typically make it happen in the way you and I don't think he would. I mean, would we have chosen this idea? Well, yeah, let's get the Roman emperor involved in this. No, no, not at all. So they, they had to, this, this picture is of a census and, and David, or excuse me, Joseph had to take Mary and they went to Bethlehem. Um, Luke makes careful note of Bethlehem being the city of David. If you heard that in the writing, um, into the town of to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, in verse 4. He makes careful point of that because it's critical, as Luke's pointing out, these are all fulfillments of prophecy. When we start looking at the idea that he would be, um, the prophecy concerning the, the child would be, um, or the king would be one from David's lineage, David's throne, um, 2 Samuel 7, 16, and Isaiah 9, 7. And he doesn't miss the prophecy concerning Bethlehem being the place where the Messiah would be born, Micah 5, 1 to 2. Okay, so the idea that he would be a son of David and that he would be born in Bethlehem, both prophesied long before this would ever occur, are being made to happen. All of it's still part of what this pagan king was doing to the people. Now, this is a, a short jaunt on foot from Jerusalem or from uh, Bethlehem, up to Bethlehem. Um, probably about a 90-mile journey on foot because they would go around Samaria instead of through it. So it would be about like walking from Clovis to Lubbock, okay? Just a short stroll, you know? I, but it wouldn't be as flat. It had a lot of ups and downs and rocks and whatnot, okay? So if you got a picture of this, it, it, you know, oftentimes the, the idea that's pictured is that, oh, they had a donkey and Mary rode on the donkey, right? We don't know that. There is nothing in this text that will justify or say that. We do not know that. In fact, he may very well have not had any beast of burden and they may have walked. And you thought, stop thinking about that. I mean, ladies, when you're that close to giving birth, you'll want to walk 90 miles over rough terrain? Sure, right? <laughs> no, I can lie, head sick, no. You know, I'm sorry, I don't want to walk 90 miles over rough terrain today myself either. I mean, if you start thinking about it, it's, it's quite a stretch, actually. So we don't know if Joseph even had a donkey. Uh, Mary is near time to give birth, according to the text. And David has taken Mary to be his wife after an angel spoke to him in a dream. And that, that kind of refers back to Matthew chapter 1, where when Joseph found out that Mary was with child, he was like, how did that happen? And of course, everybody else was like, yeah, Mary, how did that happen? 
Um, and, and he was going to just, just send her away. But the angel of the Lord spoke to him in a dream and said that this child was the Holy Spirit's work. And Joseph believed, and he took Mary, and, and now she's with him on this. Joseph believed God, um, and now Mary was with him. And since then, while they are in Bethlehem, the time comes for her to give birth. The text says very clearly at the end here at verse 7, um, they wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. I just want to talk about the inn for just a second. Because when she came time for her to, to bring this child into the world, they weren't in even, you know, they, they didn't have a room, okay? And, and by the way, the places that they would stay, the inn, the Greek word for that was kataluma, okay? And what it was typically, especially in a small town like Bethlehem, would be a place where travelers could stop and rest with their animals. Okay, it wasn't a hotel or a motel. And so if you perceive anything even closely resembling a place where you got a bed and you can sleep and all, the, no, no. But it would have at least been set aside and there would be an area for people to, to lay down and sleep and the animals would be kept secure and whatnot. And, and somewhat at least set up for that kind of thing. They didn't even have that. They didn't even have that. What we know and understand best is that they were probably in what we would consider to be a stable, which could have been a structure of sorts or even a cave. And we don't really know that for sure. Okay, but they're in a place where only the animals were meant to be. Okay, it wasn't clean. It wasn't fit for humans. There isn't anything about it that was pretty and nice. Okay, you know all the pictures that we get or the, the um, uh, models of Jesus in the, the manger, in the manger, they look so cute. They really, do you realize it ain't like that? It is not like that at all. It's not even close when we really think about it. And it, it's kind of important for us to reflect on the reality of what is happening. So the time comes for her to give birth. She's not at home where they might have the comfort of family, friends, neighbors. There's no midwives. She can't even be sure if the family and friends would have even looked with favor on her anyway. There's no inn at Bethlehem for them to be in. The entire population of Israel in Roman occupied territory was all wandering about going to their originating uh, cities. So it's likely that many others arrived at Bethlehem to be registered too. There was no place left to stay. And uh, so uh, they wound up in probably a stable is what it sounds like. Uh, they, they may have been later arrivals, too, due to Mary's condition and the distance they were traveling. We, we, we really can't pinpoint any of those things except what the Bible tells us. Being allowed to use the barn or the stable may have been perceived as merciful, merciful treatment for her condition in those days. May have been perceived in that way. Um, so they were probably in the, the stable, um, the state, this, this place that we were at, okay, just think it through one more time. It wasn't clean. It wasn't fit for humans, but for animals. There was no doctor, no family, no friends, no pastor, no midwife, no bed, no running water, and poor lighting at the very best. Sounds like the ideal place to have a baby, right? I mean, <laughs> think... And it's, so you got just Mary with Joseph at her side, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger in an animal's feeding trough. As we said, because there was no room at the inn. Think about it. They, they didn't have a chance to check in at the motel and get a shower and a bite to eat first. They were tired, dirty, and probably a bit hungry. Swaddling cloths are used to bind and protect a newborn infant. We have no idea where the cloths came from. You, you know, my often, what, did they bring them? I mean, the, probably what occurred is people that traveled in those days, when you traveled on the road, 
you were subject to probably getting hurt or injured sometimes, okay? And sometimes there was violent people. So people would, under their clothing, they would wrap strips of cloth around them. And so if you got hurt, you could pull some of that stuff off and make a bandage and hopefully make it to the next place where you could get some help. That might very well be where the swaddling cloths came from. They were basically just strips of cloth that were wrapped around her and then they were used to make swaddling cloths to keep the baby's arms and legs tucked in so he wasn't flailing about. He's laid in a manger, an animal feeding trough. It's actually pretty wise, you can't fall out or be otherwise harmed, at least, while Mary catches her second wind. Is it pretty? Not really. Is it clean? Not in the slightest. You think there might be a few germs? Mm-hmm. Is it practical? Yeah. Is it humble? So there's the picture now of our Savior being born of human flesh, coming to this world, and probably the most humble birth that any of us could ever imagine. A theologian and um, author Daryl Bach describes this in a couple of sentences. He says, the promised one of God enters creation among the creation. The profane decree of a census has put the child in the promised city of messianic origin. God is quietly at work and a stable is Messiah's first throne room. A stable is his first throne room. Amen. Do we have that song? Nope. Okay. We would try to play the song, but we can't do it. So I'm just going to tell you about it. If you've never heard it before, I would encourage you, to, you, can, you can get it online very easily. Um, there's an album called Behold the Lamb of God by Andrew Peterson. Um, in, in the middle of that album is a song called Labor of Love. But I would encourage you, the, the, the album talks about the coming of Christ from Genesis all the way to John's Gospel. Okay? And song. And it's, it's just utterly amazing. It was put out about 15 years ago. So that's my pause to tell you that. I, the song fits what we're talking about. I, I wish we had it, but we don't. So consider briefly for a moment the contrast between the births of John the Baptist and Jesus. They were related, right? We know that, right? And uh, uh, John was born in the city of Jerusalem, uh, where the temple of God and Israel's largest city, presumably born at home. His neighbors and relatives were rejoicing with him. That's documented in Luke 1, 58 and 59. He was a reputable and well-known family. Uh, his father was a priest and righteous before God and walking blamelessly. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, tiny town in a stable. He didn't have any family, friends, or relatives. He was lying in an animal feed trough, relatively unknown parents, though right standing before God. God identifies with those he came to save in the most profound way. He doesn't come with a flourish or with great pomp and circumstance. He doesn't do any of those things. He came in a most humble manner, looking for his people who are also humble and of a contrite heart. Amen. This is the picture of your Savior coming into this world. And up to this point in the text, it's shocking. It's just utterly shocking to think that the Lord of glory would come in such a humble means. One would think that a king would be dressed in the greatest and most wonderful of garments, even at birth. Amen? I mean, each of our children, I would dare say, each of our children, grandchildren, all of our children, have been better treated at their birth than Christ was. 
I don't think anybody would probably argue with that. So, with that picture, the book turns to a scene with shepherds. They're off in the fields nearby. And they're out there keeping watch over their flock by night. And uh, as they're doing this, um, it's nighttime in the region. Some nearby shepherds are watching their flocks. Um, shepherds in that day were considered second-class citizens, okay? I mean, they were often considered thieves just because of who they were. I mean, they, they just were not looked upon with any regard. But who does this angel of the Lord appear to? The angel of the Lord appears to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around him, and they were filled with fear. And yeah, you got to picture this for a minute, okay? Here's these, these, these shepherds out with their flock, and all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord appears over them, and the, angel, and the glory of the Lord fills the sky. And if you read in, in Scripture, when the, when the tabernacle was first finished, when Israel came out of Egypt, and they finally put the tabernacle together when it was finally assembled, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. They said nobody could go in the tabernacle because of the glory of God filling it. The same thing happens with the temple when it is finally built. And again, you will see that same picture come up in Revelation. It's again, when the glory of the Lord fills a place, uh, it, man cannot even go there. There's just this sense, especially in the Old Testament, that we can't be in the presence of God because of our brokenness. Okay, there's really that, just that picture that's there, and the glory of God. And so here's these shepherds, and this angel appears, and the glory of the Lord shines, and they are terrified. But that's kind of stunning all in itself, because these guys aren't afraid of nothing. They spend their nights out there guarding the sheep from predators. They'll beat them away with clubs. They'll use their slings and whatever it takes. They're not afraid of any wild beast out there at all. But when that angel appears and the glory of the Lord shines, they're trembling with fear. So a couple things to think about here. The glory of the Lord, I mean, can you imagine you're out there in the middle of the night and all of a sudden the, it's almost daylight. With this glory of God, this kind of glory of God shining all around. And the other thought you want to think about just for a second is angels. Angels aren't cuddly. Okay? They're not. If you read your Bible carefully, you'll find that every, every time an angel appears, somebody goes, ooh, if they're not just totally afraid. And just this last thought, there's never been in recorded in the Bible at all an angel that is female. So whenever you see the little statues and stuff in our Bible stores and whatnot, keep that in mind. It's kind of an interesting thing because we, we twist stuff. And, and we twist it because we want certain things to be certain ways. We want things to be pretty. We want the, Angels are fearsome. They are fearsome. When you behold an angel, it's going to scare you. It's going to startle you at the very least. So they're there, the glory of the Lord shines all around, and they're afraid, and the angel calms their fears, saying, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. Good news, he's bringing the gospel, the good news, the story of the good news that, that God is bringing. A great joy in this news, the world will rejoice, and even today we continue to rejoice as we remember and then he says that, um, it, that a great joy that will be for all the people. That, that idea of will be, meaning not yet fully happen, means this is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. It's just starting now, but the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And it's for all the peoples of the world. It isn't just for this church or any other church or any other believers today. It's for all people. Because you, how many know that God wants to save as many as he can? He'd delight if everyone would come to repentance, as Peter writes. That's what God wants. In, in 1 John 2, 2, it talks about the idea that Jesus' sacrificial death is sufficient for the salvation of everyone. The question isn't whether that's sufficient. The question is whether we believe. The question is whether we believe. So he's heralding this gospel, and then he brings this the idea of the good news for all the world. And you, know, you think about the idea of John 
3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And there's something also that Isaiah pointed to, if you refer back to Isaiah 52.10 and 56, 1 through 8, for all the people. Isaiah was pointing not towards a Messiah that would come just for the Jews, but a Messiah that would come to save us all. And then the revelation bursts forth, he says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Unto you is born. And it was God's giving to you. God's bringing to you a Savior. Amen? I mean, you think about it. God is doing this for us. He did this for us. He loves you so much that this is something he would do. His only son incarnated into human flesh. Think about it. I mean, this, this is just utterly amazing. And then how is he born and brought into the world in a manger? How dare we ever be haughty before him? How dare we ever... Never mind, I won't go there. Unto you is born points back to Isaiah 9, 6. And the word usage is really just pointing forward from what Isaiah was saying. And that angel says, it happened today. The Son of God is born a man. He is Emmanuel today. Isaiah 7, 14. It happened in the city of David, identifies the location as Bethlehem, according to Micah 5, 2. Even as it points to the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant for the throne of David to be filled, 2 Samuel 7, 16. And he's the Savior, the one spoken of by, by Isaiah, who would open the blind eyes and set the prisoners free, Isaiah 42, 6 through 7. One of the servant songs of Isaiah. Christ, the anointed one of God, spoken of throughout Scripture. He's the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15. He's the seed of Abraham, spoken of in Genesis 12.1-3. He's the star of Jacob, Numbers 24.17. He's part of Judah's tribe, Genesis 49.10. He's the son of David, Isaiah 11. 1 through 10, he's a prophet, Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19, priest after Mel the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110, 4. He is the king in David's line, Jeremiah 23, 5. He's the son of God, Psalm 27, or Psalm 2, 7 and 8. He's the son of man, Daniel 7, 13. He is Emmanuel, God is with us. Isaiah 7, 14, he is the righteous branch spoken of in Jeremiah 23, 5. He's the servant of Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Indeed, he is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He is all these things and more. He is the Messiah. He is. He is the Messiah. He is God. He is Jehovah. He is the Almighty. Now, I don't know about you. Now, I can't remember all that I just read to you. I had to read it. But when I started thinking through what I just read, I kind of trembled inside. It's just the wonder of it all. The wonder of, of, of just who he is. The announcement of the angel to the shepherd includes a sign for them to affirm the word of the Lord that was spoken to them. The sign has two parts. First, the baby will be wrapped in swaddling cloths. Second, he will be lying in a manger, in a feed trough. He's not going to have royalty dress clothes or anything like that. He's going to be just wrapped in rags, basically, and he's going to be lying in a manger. The Savior, who is Christ the Lord, is not being pampered in a luxurious crib, but lying in a manger. He's not dressed in fine clothing for an infant of royalty, but ordinary bindings to protect him. The Son of God will be found in rather ordinary apparel with an animal feeding trough for a crib. Jesus, Son of David, has no place to lay his head in the city of David at his birth. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The whole host of heaven, this, this angel, a multitude of them, the heavenly host praising the heavenly armies, the, the, the vastness and the multitude of angels praising God. Can you imagine that? I just think about it for a minute. He's in uh, this Christ is, is in this manger, but the angels in heaven, they know what's happening. They, they, they understand that part at least, even though it isn't for them. Salvation isn't for the angels, it's for us. And they're looking at it and they're praising God, and all the heavenly host of angels are praising God because of what he's done. They all praise and glory to God. It's an image, it's an image of the worship of the heavenly host who are rejoicing in the coming of the Savior who is Christ the Lord. They do not even fully understand, though they long to, 1 Peter 1, 12. But they praise God and give glory to him. Might we do the same? The angels are not saved by this work of God. We are, yet they praise him. Glory to God in heaven, in the highest, through this humble and obscure birth to very ordinary people. Peace, peace that has come. Peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Not like the peace that we talk about in the news nowadays. The peace that he's talking about is that we're reconciled to God. We have peace with our creator. We're no longer at odds. In fact, there's going to come a day from this point on that some 30 years later when that curtain in the temple is going to be torn when he dies. And the separation from the man and God is gone. And that we can come, come to God, that we can approach him like we never could before. Why? Because we've been made whole. We've been sanctified in the blood of Jesus Christ, lest we have no hope any other way. Think about it, brothers. This is what all of this is leading to. This is what it's all for, in, in essence. God is pleased to reconcile all who believe in his Son, and the peace of God will be with us always. John 3.18, Romans 5.1. As soon as the angels departed to heaven, the shepherds made haste to Bethlehem to see this that the Lord had revealed to them. You know, they heard it and they said, they didn't say it. That's crazy. Some of us might have done that, huh? Think about it. You say, but I believe all this if it happened. And you didn't know what this said? How would you react? But they didn't, no, they said, but let's go see this thing. So they headed to Bethlehem. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger, just as had been told them. And the word of the Lord was confirmed for them. And they began to tell everybody else about it. That apparently the other people had gathered already. And the people that had heard what the shepherds were saying were kind of like, Wow. They, they, they found it just, they were trying to get their heads wrapped around it. Um, and when you actually read the text there, it, it says, um, yeah, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They were, <laughs> wow. It's just this amazement, this amazement of what's happening and who the story's coming from. But these things Mary treasured in her heart. The angels had revealed to the shepherds exactly what was transpiring. What a confirmation. All the angels in heaven are rejoicing and praising God at the birth of her baby boy. And the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all they had heard and then confirmed by sight to be exactly as they were told. Again, God does everything he says he will. If he said it, he will do it. If he said it, it is true, it is real. And the last line that I read this morning, it says, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived, conceived in the womb. Mary and Joseph were very obedient to have him um, circumcised on the right day, the proper day. And they were very obedient to what the angel had told Mary beforehand, that his name, he shall be called Jesus. And they submitted to God's will and did exactly what they were asked. Good story, huh? Yes. 
So I ask you this morning as I close, as we're coming on Christmas, and you think of what God's done, you think about the glory revealed in this humble birth. Think about the treasure that you've been given in Jesus Christ. Think about all of this, and then I want you to do something. This is what I want you to do. I want you to make him, I want you to make Jesus the center of your Christmas. And when you see, I don't want to be too blunt, but when you see fat men in red suits, that's not it. When you see the reindeer, that's not it. The snowman, that's not it. Jesus is it, and only him. That's what the story's pointing to, brothers and sisters. The treasure that has been born unto you. And so I would submit to you this morning, please treasure him with all your hearts. Amen. Father, thank you that you would speak to us in a, a straightforward manner. And thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for just helping us to see how he came into this world. And I, I pray, Father, that because sometimes in our lives as Americans, Lord, we, we're so materialistic, it's pathetic. And then I read this story of how my Savior and my Lord came into the world and he didn't have anything. And I think, why am I so desiring so much junk in my life? And I pray for all of us, Lord, that we might be, we might find satisfaction. We might find joy. We might find everything in your Son, in Jesus. That our hopes, our dreams, and everything would be fulfilled in him. And that he would be the treasure we would hold to for the rest of our days. He would be the treasure that we point our children to and our grandchildren. He would be the center of our lives forever. Amen.
And so I'd urge you this day and every day, and I would pray even that may our Lord Jesus be the center of your Christmas, of your lives, of your hopes, and of your dreams. May he be the center of everything. And may he truly be our Lord, our Savior, and our King. And with that treasure, go forth today, holding Jesus, holding him on high, his name on high. Amen.